when I was growing up in the village, I could see my mother and her friends coming together and there's something called chama here in Kenya. It's, it's like women coming together and they contribute money and give it to one person. So it, it just, I just realized that women, they love investing, putting money aside yeah. for maybe for the future, for something. Right. But now with, with my mother, she, she could do this kind of uh, contributing money and giving to friends and friends and friends. But right now, imagine if they can do the same thing, they come together, contribute the small money and buy Bitcoin. I can imagine how far they could have gone economically wise because th their mind is thinking about investing, putting money together. So I think Bitcoin is important to women. Hello, everybody. I just wanted to take a moment to provide a bit of background on this interview before we dive in. The two ladies featured on this episode, Edith Mpumwiri and Mary Usagi, are recent graduates from a program called Bitcoin Dada. Dada is Swahili for sister. The program is based in Kenya, and it educates African women about Bitcoin as a means to promote financial empowerment. From what I've noticed, the women who graduate from this program not only feel this sense of financial empowerment, but also a sense of sisterhood and a deep camaraderie with the other women in the program, which I find fascinating and heartwarming. I interviewed the program's founder and leader, Lorraine Marcel, on episode seven of the podcast, if you'd like to go back and listen to that before or after you listen to this episode. Lorraine is an incredible person, and I think you will really enjoy that episode as well. Lastly, we had some technical difficulties with audio toward the last few minutes of recording this episode. Some of Edith's words and singing, yes, singing, got cut off a bit. While this is a bummer, we still captured an hour's worth of an absolutely amazing conversation. And I have little doubt that you'll be moved by what these two women have to share. So without further ado, let's dive in. Here's my interview with Bitcoin Dada's Edith Mpumwire and Mary Usagi. All right, everybody, welcome back. We are here today with two recent graduates of the Bitcoin Dada program, graduates from cohort five of Bitcoin Dada. Um, we have with us Mary Usagi from Kenya and Edith Mbapwire. Please, per, please let me if I, <laughs> I'll let you say that. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Thank you. Um, I have been looking forward to doing this for a while. Um, when the graduation ceremony uh, took place for the, the cohort that they graduated from um, at Bitcoin Dada, I gave a small talk. And uh, as I was talking to the audience virtually, I was not in Kenya. I had this thought that um, I'd like to sort of learn a little bit more about some of the people who are coming to the Bitcoin Dada program. And then also today, I'm going to have um, these two ladies teach me a little bit about what they have learned about Bitcoin. So let me hand the mic over to you. I'll hand it over to Mary first. If you could tell the audience a little bit about yourself, I would greatly appreciate it. Hello, my name is Mary Usaji from Kenya. I am a web developer by profession and um, a recent graduate from the Bitcoin Dada uh, Bitcoin program. And I'm so glad to be here today with you, Frank, to speak about what we learned. Looking forward to this conversation. Likewise, thank you so much. And Edith, I'll pass the yeah. mic to you. Okay, hi everyone. My name is Edith Mpomuire from Uganda. I stay in Jinja. I studied business statistics and I've been practicing banking for about 12 and 12 years and about eight months now. I've done a couple of things. I love singing. I have done uh, Radio Diaries production and so many more. I'm a mother, I'm a child, I'm a sister and everything. But I, the most exciting thing about me this year is that recently I completed um, my Bitcoin education program with Bitcoin Dada in Nairobi. And that is my biggest definition right now. So. Mm. I can't wait to have you all and learn and unlearn very many things with you today. Over to you, Fawn. Beautifully. Yeah, beautifully put. Thank you. And yeah, I, I love 
how you're talking about the effect that Bitcoin data had on you. And I've noticed that from a few different people, which is one of the reasons that I wanted to do this interview. So let's actually start with a sort of a broad overview. We'll go back over to Mary. Um, why is Bitcoin good for people in Kenya, for Kenyans? Why is Bitcoin necessary good, however you would put it? Um, in Kenya, I believe Bitcoin is very important because mostly when we get money here in Kenya, we run to buy things like land and real estate. So we really believe in these things that, oh, if we buy land in the next 10 years, I'm going to make, like, it's going to appreciate in value and I make money. But uh, sometimes it doesn't. Things happen. The government comes and takes the land. They say this is government land or just things happen, you know, that you can't have control of. But with Bitcoin, if you can take the same money, and, and again, with, with land, we keep on buying all the time. It keeps getting like smaller and smaller. We are becoming so many. And in the next 20 years, we'll not have anything to buy. <laughs> mm. So at least for Bitcoin, we can put the same, um, the same um, investment in Bitcoin. And you see, Bitcoin is scarce. It's scarce. With time, everybody will have a bit of Bitcoin, and it means uh, high in value. So it's a good investment to me. That's number one. Then number two, uh, Bitcoin is has now is not geographically bound, so anybody can can own Bitcoin in Kenya. So from Nairobi in the big city to the small village where I come from, anybody with a phone can own Bitcoin right now. So I think it gives us a, a sense of a financial freedom, and this is something that we didn't have financial freedom. It's just the the few people that have it but with bitcoin everybody has access to this kind of a financial system and it can create financial freedom so i think it's very important in kenya to have bitcoin perfect thank you so much and edith, yeah edith over to you in uganda what would what would you say are the uh um why is bitcoin important i believe that uh, bitcoin is important first as a store of value it is actually we normally term it as digital gold it stores the value of money and keeps it from um, inflating more. Actually, I keep thinking that Bitcoin will help to drive out our already dead currency. Um, and when you look at it in, in the real sense, it has all the essential properties of money, like acceptability, durability, it is divisible, it is portable, and the fact that it's scarce, it is the best because... Uh, we we'll know that it has a maximum cap. It won't be like this other money that will be printed every other time someone feels like printing money. So it is like a sure store of value. And I believe that is what Uganda needs right now. Okay. Submit, yeah. Perfectly put. Sounds like you you did your homework while you were in the Bitcoin data program. I liked how you listed all those <laughs> properties of money so easily and so readily. Nice work. Um, this is a question I've been very much looking forward to asking both of you. Why is Bitcoin particularly important to women? And if you would like, please let us know why that why it's particularly important to women in Africa. If you'd like to add, if you'd like to go a step further, uh, I'll start with Edith on this one. Well, I'll I'll be so particular with women. I'm very passionate because one. In Africa, when you look at the population, women are the biggest in number. And if I were a business person and I needed to invest anything, I'd look for something that suits women because I would know that there is ready market. Now, Bitcoin comes in to solve very many issues because in Africa, especially Uganda, many households are run by women, right from paying school fees, from doing businesses, from running the household errands, food, like essential needs are all provided by women. So the challenge, like I said, we have been having a dying currency. If uh, I'll take an example, a very simple example. If I had 10,000 shillings, Ugandan shillings last year, actually last year to be, to be exact, I would be able to afford bread, like a loaf of bread and maybe a kilo of sugar. But currently, a loaf of bread is about 6,500 shillings, and then uh, a kilo of sugar is about uh, 7,000 shillings. So the 10,000 that used to afford me both things would take me to a supermarket, and I can only afford one thing. So what does Bitcoin come in to solve there? 
it comes in to solve the inflation problem. I would know that my money has value, probably even more value, because when you look at the latest news with the doubling, with the 44,000 uh, USD equivalent, it, it gives us hope as women. Now, like, secondly, women, um, if a woman is empowered, you'd know that their household is empowered, that children are empowered, and it would help is adaptability. Now, imagine if you started teaching money and its values, and not just money, but money that has value to a woman. Their child would know the value of saving in Bitcoin. They are, they'll go to school to study something that would add value to them, not just for the sake. And now when it comes to education, I'm very passionate as well, because I believe that uh, in school, we basically get skills but the biggest education, we get it from home. I believe uh, Mary and Frank, you'll agree that there's some things that you learned from your mother that you still do the very exact way that you learned. So imagine Amen. if a woman is empowered, hmm? it, would, uh, it would ease a lot of things. It would break a lot of ice. And that's the future, basically. Yeah. Submit. Beautifully put. Beautifully put. Mary? Wow, that's 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 really that's really good, Edith. Okay. I'm just thinking, like when I was growing up in the village, I could see my mother and her friends coming together, and there's something called chama here in Kenya. It's it's like women coming together and they contribute money and give it to one person. So it it just I just realized that women they love investing, putting money aside yeah. for maybe for the future for something. Right. But now with with my mother, she she could do this kind of uh, contributing money and giving to friends and friends and friends. But right now, imagine if they can do the same thing. They come together, contribute the small money and buy Bitcoin. I can imagine how far they could have gone economically wise because th their mind is thinking about investing, putting money together. So I think Bitcoin is important to women. Again, in Africa, most people, uh, men, like, let me just say men, when you're born, you just know that you're going to get land from your, from your, from your parents. Women, you didn't have that. You just know that you'll get married to someone who has land and maybe you, you inherit that land. So we didn't get that from our parents. So we had to work, maybe you have to work, work hard to get your own sense of financial belonging. Mm -hmm. And that's why I think with Bitcoin, with just a wallet, you have your own Bitcoins. You don't need to uh, expect from your parents to maybe inherit bitcoins from your parents or something. So both men and women right now, we have that access to bitcoins. It's not like land where you have to be born a man to, <laughs> so that you can inherit from your parents. So at least mm -hmm. I like bitcoin because now we are all included. We can own it and we can use it as much as we want. And you know, women, we are multipliers. You give us something, yes. we multiply it. So. <laughs> <laughs> So with the, with 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 this with this opportunity of Bitcoin, we you can imagine how much we can take the world out there and just make everybody adapt to this uh, technology of Bitcoin. Yes. yes so I important. wanted to add something when Mary mentioned um, something yeah. about inclusion. You know how um, financial institutions yeah. come with all this jazz, financial inclusion for all. But when you look at when you digress a little bit yeah. in inclusion, what is it? It is about the time, the space, the means. Now, being a banker, I know this, that when the bank closes at 4.30, even if you have a dying child, they'll tell you, you know what, you, we have alternative means. Maybe you should try mobile phone banking. Maybe you should try using the ATM or Visa. But what is the practicability? Hmm? When they say inclusion, does every woman know how to read those bank documents? Does every can every woman be able to make the time? Like I said, women run their families literally, and like uh, in Uganda, most women depend on agriculture for survival, for finances. So imagine a woman who wakes up, goes to the garden at six a.m. or five, uh, picks produce, comes back home, preps their child for school. Then when the when the children go to school, they take their produce to the market. And then they're running back home make, to make sure that the dinner for the kids is ready. Where is the time for banking? 
where is the time for traveling literally to a physical financial institution or now imagine the P2P network of Bitcoin. All they have to do is to maybe make that call or send that message and they exchange their Bitcoin, their fiat with Bitcoin. Or if imagine yeah. if Bitcoin was acceptable, like globally, it would be very easy. I say, you know what, Mary, send me this with the bit refill. I don't have to walk somewhere to, to buy airtime. I just have mm-hmm. to go to my Bitcoin account and and follow the prompts and buy airtime. So inclusion, financial inclusion. And the other thing we have to know is that Bitcoin didn't come to make sure we are all banked. It came to actually unbank all of us yeah, so that you have, your, right. you have your yeah. own bank on your phone, on your computer. Okay. And I mean, that no. is the magic. Yeah. Agreed. Beautifully put, making me emotional. Um, the first person... <laughs> I ever really sat down to teach about Bitcoin was my mom, who I'll give Mm. a shout out to now, who actually was the person who saved money for the down payment for my parents' first house. My mom, my mom was actually my dad's boss when they met. My father was working at a movie theater and she was the manager of that movie theater. Nice. My mom has always, yeah, played a very (laughs) active role in managing the household, finances, all of that stuff. I get a lot of my own financial acumen from my mom. And I wouldn't be here today speaking with both of you without her. So I'll give her one more shout out. She was the first person a few years ago. We love you, mom. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) She, uh, when I explained Bitcoin to her, she she not only was like, oh, the number goes up. She she got it. She understood it relatively quickly. And Mm. she said, you know, I think you should spend more time trying to explain, you know, teach people this. And that's when I started writing in this space three years ago. So I, um, I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for her. So we will give her a shout out. And I, um, most of the people who ask me questions about it here in the States, um, are women, sometimes single mothers, people who are looking to have their own financial capabilities without permission, without asking anyone else. So I, uh, this is one of the reasons that I'm so absolutely sort of mesmerized and, and uh, mm-hmm. amazed with what Marcel Lorraine, the head of Bitcoin Data, has created and the effect that it's having on women like yourselves. So thank you very mm-hmm. much for sharing and offering that perspective to the audience. Um, of course, yeah. Um, I want to go back to you, Edith. You mm-hmm. talked about how you have sort of two sides to yourself. This was in a previous conversation we had, mm-hmm. not something that's recorded. You mm-hmm. said you have this academic side, and that's more of the side of you that's been working in banking. You have, mm-hmm. you know good cognitive capacity you're smart all this stuff but then you have this other sort of emotional side where you where you like to sing and you like to work in community development Mm -hmm. so you mentioned something when we first spoke you said that bitcoin might be a way to help you synthesize these two sides of yourself do you still feel that way and if so how would bitcoin do that okay well really it is a temptation usually when someone asks you to talk about yourself you talk about the banker, the manager, the, but who is Edith when that job is gone? Who is Edith when I don't have any title anywhere? So, and for me, that is the biggest uh, definition of myself. Like I said, I studied business statistics. I have a long story why I ended up there because as I wanted to study music, but my parents couldn't let me. Well, I had also, I had also passed my physics and mathematics very well. So I had another option at at university. Then I graduated. And my first job after university was a Radio Diaries producer. Now I had to go to the villages, interview people, get their stories, put them in in episodes and produce it. And that was like the best days of my life. But then at the Mm. studio, I used to work with men with uh, plated hair and, you know, like how... (laughs) many producers I looked at and now um, I was daddy's little girl and he wasn't comfortable with all that like the company that I was moving with the people that used to inspire me he was scared he thought I was was going to end up uh, some sort of weirdo so he I remember this one day he took me he held my hand on one lunch break and said you know what I'm taking you to this particular institution to apply for this job. So I went, applied for my job, got it. I was one of the best. The oral interview, I nailed it. And I'm here and I kind of like feel stuck here. 
And in as much as I'm excelling at the bank, um, it leaves some part of me untouched. Um, I used to love to do, I love to do field work. Everyone who has worked with me knows I love to sell. I can literally resell to your earphones and you buy them higher. So <laughs> I can sell these were, anything. These were expensive, yeah. so I don't need yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So, and I, I, I do a lot of financial literacy, but now see, the difference is that this is with fiat. And now that my eyes were unshelled, I was orange peeled and I know about Bitcoin. I feel like I have some different kind of fuel and the fuel that makes a lot of sense because mm-hmm. Bitcoin and I are like mates. We met at a point where I was breaking. I was going through a suspension from work. Um, I was suffering effects of um, hacking into the system. And then I found this technology, Bitcoin. It is a money transfer technology. It is money in itself. And it is almost, I think it's hacked. It, it can't be hacked into, like if you do everything right, your money is safe with you. You have your own keys. Girl, Mary, you got your own keys, yeah? <laughs> so, so I feel like the other me is resurrecting. Like mm. Bitcoin has, has added that flavor to my life that had long gone, the seasoning. Because now I wake up every day, I'm confident. When I'm talking about money, I am confident. I know that my money is safe with me. I can easily pass it on to someone because I am very passionate. I'm a very passionate girl. Like with everything I do, I want you to believe it and see it through my eyes. So... Thank you so much, Bitcoin Dada. Thank you, Lorraine, myself, for <laughs> mentoring me, for making me, for bringing out this girl again, for for, mm. for coming Edith alive again. So mm. that is the two sides of me. Like there is this, what I studied and all, but there is the real me who loves communities, who loves mm. to deal with children, who loves to teach. And I believe that... In one way or another, Bitcoin has given me a chance to do that, and I'm forever grateful. Mm. You are you are quite a poet, Edith. You say things. You have a very eloquent way of saying things. So thank you very yeah. much. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. It's, it's, it's quite impressive. It is quite impressive. Thank you for sharing and being so open with us. We really appreciate thank it. You. Yeah, Mary, uh, you are a developer. Um, I think when we first talked. Um, yeah, a web developer. You talked about how you, I think a while back came across Bitcoin, uh, didn't have a good, you know, kind of thought it was a scam, um, had a bad experience with it, but have now sort of come back to it through Bitcoin data. So could you tell us a little bit about yourself and now about your sort of understanding of your rela- re- understanding of Bitcoin and your sort of refined relationship with it? As a developer? Yeah, so for someone who has a bit more of a technical mind. I'll, I'll, I'll phrase it like that. Oh, okay. Okay, I would say I'm a web developer by profession. Mm-hmm. And I kind of am trying to shape to the blockchain development, which will take time because it's not easy though. <laughs> mm-hmm. But from a technical point of view, I understand that Bitcoin, it is the blo- blockchain the Bitcoin blockchain is the safest blockchain uh, on earth mm-hmm. because it is decentralized and it is managed by miners who are confirming transactions mm-hmm. like nodes. And these nodes, they are following a certain type of rules. So if these rules are broken, nothing will be confirmed on the blockchain. So the security of, of, of the Bitcoin it's top tier because of the blockchain technology, which is um, the transaction. I mean, the technology is a self-running algorithm, which it's not controlled by anyone. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's not compared to, you see, the banks, they are being controlled by a central, a central authority, mm-hmm. where if I'm sending money, someone is confirming that money. So they, they have the power of either confirming it or not confirming it. They can just end up even just confirming half of it and all that. But with the mm-hmm. blockchain technology, 
it's different because once the, the program is set already, it's working, it's running, mm. so it can't be changed. If I'm sending money, it's gone, it's going. Mm. So from a technical point of view, I think um, this is the best technology that you can ever have on earth. And we can really build very much life-changing applications that will deliver us from the cocoon that our authorities have <laughs> put us in. Yeah, sure. So, yeah. And again, Bitcoin is an open source um, technology, which means that I can read and I can see yeah. how the, the the things work, the functionality work. So there's nothing hidden. There's no hidden charges. Mm -hmm. There's no hidden fun functions that one day someone will wake up and change a code and everything is gone. No, mm -hmm. the code is open source. You can see it. Even some other companies, the other like cryptos, they have tried to copy. They copy the, um, the blockchain code. I mean, the Bitcoin code. They'll try to simulate how it works. And it ended up being just centralized. Most of the coins out there, right. like they are centralized, they are controlled. Yeah. The people can wake up in the morning and just decide to mess up with everything. It's not like Bitcoin. Yeah. So for me, Bitcoin is the most secure, Bitcoin blockchain is the most secure technology that you can ever have. And I look forward to an Africa where we're going to develop apps on the Bitcoin blockchain and something that will change the future and make yeah. us, set us free. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. I appreciate that. I'm going to ask the, the, the next question. I'll, I'm going to go right back to you, Mary, just to follow up. Um, so I think it's in the United Nations, it's in their charter that human beings have uh, the freedom to transact. And so when you think about Bitcoin, some people call it sort of like a fundamental human right, that it's a permissionless network with which we can transfer value to one another. Mm -hmm. um, why do you think this is particularly important where you're from? Why do you think people in Kenya, or you could speak about Africa at large if you'd like, why is this particularly important in a place like Africa or Kenya? Yes, Bitcoin, it gives us freedom and human beings will love freedom. Um, I think like, for example, if last year we had elections here in Kenya and if a group of people decide not to concur with the government or not to side with the government yeah. or come up with just they start to actually after elections we had something called there's something called we call it mandamano here in Kenya is protesting that we don't want this current government <laughs> if the government can decide and say marry with your group you will not transact any money. Your bank account will be frozen. You will not move. You cannot pay for anything. They'll do that. Yeah. They'll have control. So, But with Bitcoin, I can go out there and make noise about the government. No one will come for my wallet. They don't even know if I have one. So it is me having control of it. And I have the right to, mm. to move around, to pay for things using my Bitcoin. So as a human being, I, I, I will feel like with Bitcoin, I have, I have freedom. I can... Mm. I can send money anywhere in the world. I can transact anywhere without being, without my race being judged, mm -hmm. without my sexual orientation being judged, yeah. without my religion being judged. Because you can imagine, I, I believe with some countries, I can't go and transact a million dollars. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they will ask you, are you, uh, are you doing some fraud or uh, what yeah. are you doing with the money? It's my money. I worked hard for it. <laughs> I want to spend it the way I want to. Why, why is someone asking me questions yeah. and restricting me from like transacting the money? If I'm sending money from one person to another through a bank, you wake up in the morning, your account is frozen. Yeah. They have taken that freedom from me. Yeah. Like it's, it's mine. Why are you fr freezing my account? So I can't eat. I will sleep hungry. I can't pay for things. I'm a human being. I'm supposed to be free. So with Bitcoin, this, I have this freedom of just spending my money anywhere in the world, wherever I want, because it's the money that I've made and I, I have the right to enjoy it. And then again, um, I'll talk in terms of savings. I think the government is taking uh, is taking um, the right of us having value for our money yeah. because if I had saved 100,000 Kenya shillings last year in my bank account, this year that money is worth 50,000. The same things I could have bought with last year with 100,000. I can't buy the same things. So the government goes ahead and prints, prints money. They, they mess up with the inflation and they don't even care about me. They don't care about my savings. They don't care about my salary because the, the, the salary is still the same. So it's the it's me as a human being 
being affected my money my value for money is being affected and, and no one cares no one cares i'll just keep crying and crying and no one cares so i think bitcoin it's it, it's it's a fundamental tool for human rights because it gives us that freedom yeah. to transact oh. and use our money without just being scared of anything yeah wow. it's a be- beautifully put and i think so, i That's just had right. a conversation yeah. with someone in cameroon yesterday we spoke about how um it's, I think actually, I'm not sure if no one cares, but I think people don't necessarily like to hear that the banks are doing this or central banks are devaluing their currency. I don't think, I think people don't want to believe that. They want to believe that the powers that be have good intentions. And it's not that they have necessarily evil intentions, but they are doing something that takes away from the value of the labor that you have, that you put out there into the world. So that's a really, really good point. Um, Edith, your, your thoughts on Bitcoin as a fundamental human right? Uh, well, first of all, its seamless nature of transactions is the most beautiful one. I remember um, in 2020, it was to be exact, 30, was it 30th, 31st, okay, I, I think 31st March, when the, there was lockdown in the country. Mm-hmm. All banks were closed, mobile money agents weren't allowed to work, they didn't have floats. People weren't allowed to move then. I put myself for a moment in someone's shoes for someone who had like a sick patient at home or a vulnerable child who needs like medical refills all the time. And I was wondering what they did that time because even you weren't allowed to drive your own car because of the lockdown. Mm -hmm. So imagine if at that moment we're dealing with Bitcoin You'd just do a P2P or pay the pharmaceutical company, send them a voucher, you have your medical refills because people who are working in the essential, in courts, <laughs> essential services were allowed to move. Now, I think the very next days when banks were open, but still we had liquidity issues. Now in Bitcoin, mm-hmm. there's not going to be liquidity issues because if I don't find the money with Mary, I'll try Frank, you know? Mm-hmm. It, it, it is decentralized, it is global, it is digital, and it is borderless. So for me to transfer money to a relative of mine who is probably in South Africa or the reverse, like if they have sent me money, they don't need any permission from any bank. They don't need any KYC. They don't have to line up anywhere because... I see many a time people lining up in the bank and then we tell them, you know what, sorry, the system has closed, so we can't serve you. I mean, this person has been lining up for the past like three hours, but because there was a very long queue, they weren't served. Yes, it happens, especially for those that have uh, relatives in the diaspora. Um, Mm. They send them like monthly upkeep. So sometimes the bank is really full. We put a tent outside to accommodate the queues and... Still, it is full. Um, and then by the time someone gets to the counter, the network will probably maybe Western Union has closed and they can't be served. So they have to travel another very many hours. So I think it kind of like takes away their rights of freedom. Yeah. So Bitcoin as a tool of uh, humanity, it, it, it bridges that gap. It closes it actually because I can send money to you, Frank. You're in the States. I'm in Uganda. And you get it instantly. Yep. The speed of transactions is unmatched. The, 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 what do I call it? Um, the authenticity is, you, you cannot do a fraudulent transaction on Bitcoin. Probably if you do it, it is with an un- amateur. But if someone has read their books, they have done their research, Sorry, Mary. We love you. Be yeah. blessed. Yeah. <laughs> oh, Mary's okay, a little bit okay. sick today, but she's she's toughing it out. Thank you, Mary. Yeah. Uh, so I think it is a tool for humanity in that you have the freedom to express yourself. You can donate to anyone without going through a formal, you know, a formal campaign. Oh, and by the way, the Bitcoin community, thank you so much. Those that donated to us when we were going for our graduation. We mm-hmm. had to travel for 15 hours in a bus just to go and graduate. But so you know, it was worth it. Amazing. And you gave us a chance to see, to see ourselves becoming someone, to see ourselves becoming different, to see ourselves accepting the world in a different form. 
and that is Bitcoin for Humanity. I've seen very many campaigns where um, like uh, Marcel and the BTC Dada community donate sanitary pads to unprivileged girls in schools. Okay. Now, I, I don't know if anyone knows, but this is a very big issue even in my country. We find school going children, sometimes they miss school, sometimes they drop out of school because they can't keep up with the cost. Imagine if a basic need like sanitary towels costs more than three dollars and actually someone cannot afford it. It's yeah. it's sad. So thank you, Bitcoin again. I don't know who Bitcoin is, I don't know what it is even, but <laughs> it is a solution, it is a force, it is um yeah. It's like a life-changing force, so we thank God for it. Yeah, that's beautifully put. And yeah, that to, for people who might not be familiar with the story that Edith was just sharing, I think it was Marcel Lorraine who had put together a program to bring the sanitary towels to women. I think it was in Kenya. I don't know if it was in Uganda as well, but that sort of giving back to the community uh, through Bitcoin donations. That's been a really big theme, I think, in the last year or two in Bitcoin with, through programs like Geyser Fund or or Bitcoin Dada, you know, different programs where people know that they have, it's very easy to donate to someone. They trust the person who they're sending the money to. That money gets turned into um, whatever goods are being delivered to people in need. And that can happen all very, very seamlessly. There's no need for, you know, international aid organizations or third parties to be involved. It's just person to person transfers. Yeah, it's very inspiring. Um, well, thank you very much for the overview and for the specific examples. I think that that's really, really, really uh, helpful to me and I hope helpful to the audience. Um, for the second part of today's conversation, I want to do something that hopefully will be a little bit of fun. So I used to be a teacher for many years, for 12 years. And uh, for some of those years, I was just a language teacher. And one of the things we used to do to practice sort of how much people have learned um, from based on whatever lesson I had just taught was do a role play. And so in this situation, I'm going to play the role of the Bitcoin skeptic, the person who calls people using Bitcoin and promoting Bitcoin scammers and blah, 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 blah. And so Mary and Edith are going to uh, play the role of the people that are here to debunk some of the of the information that I bring to them. So it's like a little bit of like a fun sort of role play to test some of the information that they learned um, in the Bitcoin Dada program. So let me start with the first question. This Bitcoin thing, I keep hearing about it. Edith, you worked in a bank. This is this is a very respectable job. Why are you why are you now involved in a scam after after all these years working in a bank? Why would you do such a thing? Actually, Bitcoin is not a scam. Um, oh, I'm sorry, my dog is barking. Can That's I okay. for a... <laughs> That's okay. And it's called Banks. Banks, shut up. <laughs> Don't mute. This is this is good material. No need to mute. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, when you read about Bitcoin, and you have been orange peeled, orange peeled, and you get to understand it, you actually will appreciate it as a solution and not as scam. And mm -hmm. I know very well that very many people have been scammed under the umbrella of Bitcoin. But mm -hmm. yeah, like I said, Bitcoin is for everyone, the good and the bad people. So some people have used it as a tool to rob others, but that doesn't make it bad. However, when you think about it, even fiat, even in fiat currency, people have been robbed. Um, I'll tell you my story, but don't laugh at me. While I was at the <laughs> university, <laughs> while I was at the university, I was walking home. I was a broke little campus girl. And I met this guy who had um, some stones in his pocket. He said, you know what? I have tanzanite. It is a very precious stone. Uh, when you sell it, it is worth so much. And then he said, you know what? And I, I, when I saw you, I liked you. I don't know. <laughs> I was charmed or something. But I believed <laughs> that guy. So he gave me tanzanite, those stones that he had. I kept them in my bag. Then he said, you know what? But these stones cost a lot of money. For me to trust you with my stones, you need to give me your mobile phone. And then, <laughs> don't laugh. I'm not so laughing. I gave him my mobile phone and he disappeared. Oh. 
then oh. he, he he wrote for me his phone number on a, on a piece of paper and said, you know what, you call me tomorrow at around this time, I'll bring you more stones, we market them and we make a lot of money. Now, I wasn't scammed in Bitcoin. I was scammed oh. because I took a very quick decision. I didn't read about it. But in Bitcoin, we believe that you need to do your underground work. Like, I don't have to believe everything my teacher tells me. I have to go back and research and say, well, if Marcel says Bitcoin is decentralized, what does it mean? So I learn about it. So Bitcoin is not as calm. Newsflash. It is legit. <laughs> it is. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's legit. And probably even more legit than very many of these things that we have known for years. Yeah. And what about you, Mary? You were a, a respectable web developer. Now you're all about this Bitcoin and working on the blockchain. Why, why would you make such a, why would you become so enthusiastic about something like this? Okay. Um, I believe a lot of people, actually the other day I was talking to some developers about blockchain technology. And they say it's a scam because here in Kenya, everybody thinks blockchain is Bitcoin or is crypto. So they, <laughs> these are two different things. Mm. So I believe you call Bitcoin a scam if you, you've not done any research. Mm. Like for me, I like a few years ago, 2017, a friend came to our office, a very close friend of mine. And she said, there's this thing called Bitcoin. And she explained like, uh, she took like 30 minutes to tell me about Bitcoin. And she told me we should put money in a mining machine. We should buy a mining machine and it will mine for us Bitcoin. I actually took my $700 and invested in that company. Wow. <laughs> they told me that I'm going to buy, a, it's going to buy a mining machine for me. And this mining machines, I don't know if they are in Thailand, no, Iceland. And I thought, and at that time when I'm putting my money in Bitcoin, in that investment, I was thinking people are like digging Bitcoin down, like they're <laughs> mining from the ground. So I, I used to think that Bitcoin is, it's, it's like a, a coin, a gold coin. Wow. <laughs> and imagine at that point, I'm putting money knowing that Bitcoin is mined from the ground. I didn't know. <laughs> so we put money in this company. And uh, they said, okay, you you will be earning. Then they give us an app, and then they say, okay, now your machine will be bought, and in two weeks you're set up, and you start oh. earning in two weeks. And I was like, yay, good. And they talked about the way Bitcoin is gonna appreciate in value, and we make money. So I put my money, and in two weeks I was I started to see some small sats on my in my in my account, mm. and I and I did. You see, I'm a very logical person. I like math, so I I did my math. I was like. If I'm going to receive this this satoshis every day, at that time I didn't know they are called satoshi. I just know they are bitcoins, <laughs> like those small units of bitcoins. So, and they said you're going to, if you put seven hundred dollars, you're supposed to earn in like three years. So I was like, if I'm earning this amount of satoshis in three years, it will not make sense. I will not have my investment back. How will I make money from it? So they said, oh, don't worry, the bitcoin will appreciate in value. And I was like, okay, fine. So then they told us, so for you to keep making more money and making more Satoshis, my Bitcoins, you need to bring your people, your family, your friends. So I went to bring my sister in, my friends, some some other women. Who are wow. <laughs> my friends. And I could see actually women, women, a lot of women came. <laughs> they were coming with the, like bundles of money. Women have money. <laughs> yeah. Women have money. They were coming with bundles of money. And what I could do, we will go to we will go to someone who has Bitcoin. We give the person money, and they, they give us Bitcoin, and we send the Bitcoins to that company, and the company gives us an account, oh, and then Lord. we wait for two weeks, and we start earning Bitcoins. So it was so interesting. You earning commission from them, and then one day the website goes down, and they're like, "Okay, it's maintenance." I'm like, "Okay, fine, it's maintenance." Mm. Okay, it oh. comes back, and at this time. What we are earning every day, the satoshis we are earning every day, they have really gone down. Like you're earning 0 0.0000 satoshis. It's not making sense. Right. And then one day you wake up and, and, the, and the website is not there. Mm. And you have no one to call. Wow. And I was getting calls from people. Hey, Mary, oh. I, I can't see my account. What is happening? I'm like, okay, wait, wait. It's just a, a normal glitch. It's going to work. <laughs> we waited for one week, nothing. Two weeks, one month. All my money, oh my even God. the satoshis that I was earning, they were all gone. And I was like, what? Okay. 
and if people were calling me like my phone nonstop was ringing and people were accusing me of getting them into a scam oh and everything and i was like okay that that was bad we lost the money and it went like that mm-hmm. i didn't even take time to learn what happened i can tell you in the next like one year 2020 mm-hmm. the same thing came the same 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 idea came and i put money into it again <laughs> Wow. <laughs> <laughs> and that's when, that's when, that's what even went down really quickly. And that's when I was like, okay, enough of this. I need to learn. So, the, and then I signed up for, um, and Binance was, was, was having a, a blockchain course. And I was like, just invested to learning that. And that's when I learned about mining, how mining works. Mm. That's for the first time in 2020, I learned that mining is not digging in the ground and getting bitcoins from the ground. <laughs> Oh, so no. people that had invested in these schemes up to now, you cannot tell them about Bitcoin because they believe it's a scam. But oh. for me, I went ahead and invested my time into learning mm-hmm. Bitcoin and to learning the blockchain. And I was like, there was, there's ways you can invest in blockchain. You don't need to give money to anybody mm-hmm. to invest for you. Just learn. There's free information on the internet. Yeah. So Frank, take your time, learn. <laughs> Go to the internet like and learn about Bitcoin. <laughs> So after you've done your research, you've learned, you've watched the videos, then come, we talk about, to tell me how Bitcoin has come because you have all this information. <laughs> yeah. So it's wow. just learning. Mm-hmm. Like, yeah. Amazing. I'm wow. going to break the roll for a second. That was a, th- thank you both for sharing. I, I've, I've been scammed as well, not around Bitcoin, but we've, I think we've all been there and it takes some vulnerability to obviously share that that happens. So thank you both mm. for sharing those stories. Uh, there's plenty of scams around Bitcoin, but I agree Bitcoin mm. itself is not a scam. Mm-hmm. All right. I'm going to go back into my role now. So even if it's not a scam, look at how many people just got hurt in FTX. And the price has gone down and look at all these people who are losing money. Yeah, I know there's inflation and all this, but look how volatile Bitcoin is. And look at all these people, like I said, that just got hurt in this FTX thing. What would you say about that? Um, well, I believe in uh, blessings in disguise. Um, I believe uh, FTF going down was um, like... Um, like a blessing in disguise because that is when actually Bitcoin started rising. And I know that as sure as day follows night, there's going to be always forces of demand and supply. So mm. there's always going to be price fluctuations, seasons change, and very many things that, <laughs> like when you look at Bitcoin, when you look at the graph of currencies and uh, cryptocurrency, Bitcoin is the oldest but still the most valuable. So mm-hmm. I know very many other things. Um, I mean, like, was it last month? Um, people who had stored their money on the exchange, I will not mention the name. They woke up and the exchange wasn't opening and they had no one to ask. And, you know, so we have to keep learning and unlearning the bad habits. Number one, never store your money on an exchange. That one, you have to know it. Um, Bitcoin Dada has a very beautiful song, but the catchphrase is, she got her own keys. So you've got to have your own keys. We know and we have learned that if you don't have your keys, you don't have your money. Hmm? Not your keys, not your coins. So you have to, to, to learn that as well. The exchange can go down. Like Mary explained, I think, in some in the first part, that uh, when you look at the other cryptocurrencies, they're all really centralized. They're owned by someone. And that someone can wake up and decide that, you know what, this is not profitable. I've gotten what I wanted and I'm closing this. So how about you who stored your money on the exchange? So it was a good <laughs> lesson. It was a bad lesson in, in the sense that some people lost their money, but good in a way that now we know that you cannot store your money in an exchange. and also. It reduces your belief in the hot wallets, like the online wallets, those that you have on your mobile phone or on your computer. You only have to keep pocket change there. It is, it's a wallet in its real definition. You don't keep, um, a hundred million dollars in a wallet. You know that you have to store it somewhere. So you only carry pocket change or disposable income in your wallet. So mm. it was a good lesson. We only have to appreciate it and learn from it and not repeat the same mistakes. Mm. 
And what about the volatility, Mary? Look how look how high the price was two two years ago. Yeah, it came back a little bit, but it's still like still pretty not exactly at its all time high, at least where I'm from in dollars. Okay, when it comes to Bitcoin and investments, we have two people. They are day traders, and we have people who just buy for holding. So if if you are someone who keeps buying and short term like you have a short term goal you need to know when to get into the market mm -hmm. because you, you can't wait until bitcoin is 50k or 100k mm -hmm. then you get in and then you start crying later when it goes down oh i've lost money it is very really volatile when you're a short time trader get in when the market is red yeah buy when it's low sell when it's high mm -hmm. but for a long time trader like me i'll buy anytime like I, I keep on buying anytime i keep on buying anytime and when i feel like i want to the sum I just few I just sell to my friends and they give me a fiat if I want to maybe use fiat. Mm -hmm. But if you just need to know you have to you need to have a plan. Like are you a long term trader or a short term short term are you a short term hold holdler or a long term holdler? So mm -hmm. if you're a short term you need to learn the news. You need to listen to what people are talking about in the crypto market. Mm -hmm. You need to know when to get in. Don't be exit liquidities. <laughs> mm -hmm. Just know when to get in and when to get out. So mm -hmm. don't buy when the prices are really going up because you, know, you are the one you start complaining mm -hmm. when they, they, there'll be a retrace that, oh, the, the price is so volatile. But if you're a long-term holder, which we are, most of us, mm -hmm. in the Bitcoin community here in Kenya, we don't care if it goes up, it goes down. It's fine because we know one day it's going to be scarce That's and right. the value will be at the top all the time. Yeah. Mm. Interesting, um, maybe to uh, add a little bit about yeah. that. Um, I think we need to appreciate the fact that Bitcoin is not... Okay, well, I know that some people make money of buying and selling, but it will make more sense if you hold it. It will make more sense if you save your Bitcoin um, I want to ask you a question, Frank. How many times do you liquid um liquidate your land to buy a suit? Mm -hmm. How many times so would you <laughs> yeah? I, I think you have me mistaken for someone who has a lot of money. I live in New York City, so I do not own any <laughs> land. <here. laughs> okay. Literally speaking. Um That's a very good question. That is a very, very good question. So yeah, that's a I've never heard someone say that. That's great. Mm -hmm. Yeah. If if it's if we're saying that Bitcoin is digital gold, it's not yeah. every time that you're going to liquidate your gold to buy Christmas clothes to buy. <laughs> so if you treat your Bitcoin as valuable as that, then you'll know why you should hold it, hold it actually, yeah. because Bitcoin in itself is an asset. You look, you're trying to shift your eyes from what you have known long enough that gold is the most valuable or land or real estate is the most valuable. I'll pose another, another question. Think about for a second the war in Gaza. If someone wa had like uh, 50 buildings on one, like on one street and all those buildings were bombed down like in, in a split second, where would their wealth be? What is your real store of value? So mm. if you can answer that question, then you know why we say that Bitcoin is a store of value. So you don't just liquidate it to buy hunkies and and birthday <laughs> presents. <laughs> yeah. That's a that's that's a pretty good argument. That's fair. But I also have all these friends that tell me how good Solana is and how good Ethereum is, and they have smart contracts on these platforms so that it's it's better than Bitcoin because of this. So why why shouldn't I buy like a basket of them? I should just buy like some Bitcoin and some Solana and some Ethereum. And wouldn't that be a better approach? Um, I think on one on one discussion that we had with the Bitcoin data data community, I said a statement and I'll say it again here for the whole world to know that even if you're even if you're thirsty. And the only liquid available is poison. You will not take it. So I want to be rude. <laughs> I want to be rude. But stern in the decision making that you can't take poison just because you're thirsty. Yeah, I know that they're available. They are there. They are out there. But what value do they hold? At the end of the day, what 
are you hoping to get? Mm. So, decision making here. Yes, they are there, they are out there. I could make a coin overnight. But you have to appreciate the fact that Bitcoin wasn't made overnight. And even Ooh. though very many coins are, um, are trying to mimic it in the cryptocurrency space, they can't match the value, the blockchain, the, they can't match the efforts and the energy that was put into. That's why we can confidently say that it is real money. It cannot be hacked. It's going to be, it's going to live on. You're sure you can easily tell your graph. You can know that next year I'll be here. Even if the fluctuations happen, yes, they will happen across the board, but Bitcoin will still be ahead. So that that's what, but, but the white paper, I think the white paper got published in like, I think it was October 31st, 2008 or 2009. And then no, 2008. And then in January of 2009, it came out. What do you mean that Bitcoin didn't happen overnight? He published a white paper, Satoshi, and then, and then it, then it appeared. Are you saying it took longer than that? Yeah, actually, like behind oh. the scenes, um, mm. there were developers there. There was a lot of knowledge. There was a lot of research. And, you know, like when you keep, like how they tell us in the bank that you save your money for the rainy day. So mm. the white paper was an asset saved for the rainy day. If you mm. realize the events that were happening around that time, it was the economic downfall across yeah. and it came in to save the day. So it wasn't an overnight piece of job. Mm. Mm -hmm. Interesting. That's a, who, yeah. that's great. Mary, please continue. Yeah. Oh, uh, sorry. P please. What's the question for me? No, I thought, the same, I, should add on, I thought you were I going to add on what I did. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, she just said it so perfectly because, and I laugh when she says that thing of you don't just drink poison because you're thirsty. <laughs> I love that phrase because I can give an example. You see, last year I, I sold my Bitcoins last year, last year, my twin, I think so. And I bought Luna. Luna is a coin that was really had the hype and everybody thought it's going to make us rich and we were so happy and we put our money in this wow. coin because it had something called the, they, they had an option of you staking your lunars and you earning good returns like 20 percent per annum i think yep. and everybody was just putting their money in luna and running away from bitcoin then one day the luna collapsed and uh, I saw my money going to zero oh and it's still zero <laughs> I saw my man going my money going to zero and because it's centralized, like if there's mm. someone controlling it, people are just, there's no control. Like it's mm. just, it's just like, to me, it's just like fiat. So from that moment, I just learned, if I want to trade these other coins, I would put like a little percentage of like 10% on those coins mm. just to make money for uh, for candy and uh, and gifts. And <laughs> But um my biggest investment it's bitcoin because mm. even as much as it goes down and up at least i'm not thinking it's gonna go to zero no no yeah. not like luna mm. even if it goes to really low prices it will always find its way up again mm. so i'm not sure if i'll ever recover my money in the in those other coins that i bought that we call them shit coins they are yeah so they say that <laughs> Uh, yeah, this this ones you just get in and get out. But if if you want to put like long term holding or long term value, you, Bitcoin is the way to go. These mm. other coins, not sure, mm -hmm. because one day you wake up and you have zero and you have no one to ask. Mm -hmm. Mm. Yeah, interesting. Wow. And I guess my last yeah. question is, yeah, you know, I've I actually studied traditional finance a little bit, and in my studies, mm. I learned about M-Pesa, and M-Pesa seems like a pretty good mobile money network. So. If M-Pesa works, then why do we need something like Bitcoin if you already have that? And I don't know if M-Pesa is available in Uganda. I know it's available or it began in Kenya and it's available in Kenya. So what do we need an alternative mobile money network for? M-Pesa is still centralized. It's controlled. Mm. And I, ha I can just transact. There's a limit on how much I can transact in a day. Mm. So if I want to send a million Kenya shillings to someone, I cannot. Even if I mm. have and I want to send, they will ask me questions. Like, Why are you sending a million shillings? Mm. Why are you doing? Even the guys that are, they trade P2P on Binance, sometimes when they trade a lot of money, like daily, their M-Pesa accounts get frozen. And they are being asked, why are you transacting so much money every day? 
those kind of things, the lack of freedom. So Mpesa is still, it's just a way of making fiat move easily, but it's still fiat. I cannot send Mpesa. I cannot send money to your number in to you, Frank. I cannot through Mpesa. Yeah. So it is geographical bound. It's only me, people in Kenya, maybe in Uganda. Mm -hmm. I can send money to, I can't send money to people in the UK and mm -hmm. all that through Mpesa. So it's, yes, it's a good technology for Kenyans, helping us to move fiat easily, mm -hmm. but still it's centralized. I don't have freedom. I can't transact much. Even if I save money, if I put money on my Mpesa, it's not adding any value. It's mm -hmm. just if I put 100 shillings tomorrow, it'll be the same 100 shillings yeah. and nothing changes. Or less, people, actually. <laughs> actually, yeah, or actually, there's a time someone hacked into the Mpesa system. They can hack the system and steal the money. Yeah. People people hack to Mpesa system they get your pin your, yeah they get to mm. actually so to you for you to have mpesa you need to have you have you have a phone and then you have a pin to access your app people can actually get to your pin they can easily crack your uh mpesa pin and steal your money which not the same cases as bitcoin wow. so i think it's it's yeah it's good but it's not solving the problems that we have for security and transparency and just having the freedom of using your money as much as you want. Yeah. yeah. I think we will leave it there. You have convinced me. I'm going to go, I'm going to go uh, maybe buy my first, my first few sats later on today. I'm going to, I just yeah. got an email from some, yeah, he, nice. there's someone who, he, yeah, he said he wants me to invest in his mining operation. So I'm going to do it that way. No, I'm just joking. <laughs> What? <laughs> wow. Uh, um, but uh, yeah, as I expected, you ladies have been educated well, and you have retained a lot of information, and it's it's it's, it's a, it is impressive. And I um I think you're both uh, to compliment you. You're excellent teachers as well. I think you do a great job of not only explaining things theoretically but also explaining practically how things apply at the ground level. And then also giving an example of what you're talking about. These sorts of things are really, really necessary mm -hmm. as more and more people will begin to ask you about, you know, what is this Bitcoin thing? What is this thing? Blah, 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 blah. You'll, 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 as I mentioned, I think at the graduation, you know, I said, mm -hmm. inevitably we all become teachers to some degree. So mm -hmm. um, to everybody, wherever you're listening to this, if you're at home, give a round of applause, they'll feel it send the energy to these two ladies. They've done their work. They do not play as I did not, as I expected. And um, I am quite impressed. So um, amazing work, Marcel Lorraine, amazing work, Mary, Edith, really, really great stuff. But before we go, I have one uh, request. And that is given that we are near the holiday season mm -hmm. and given that Edith is a, uh, an artistic soul, she is going to sing us a cappella, a Christmas song. Ooh. So, yeah, we'll, we'll let her decide right now. We were going to try to do it together. We tried yesterday. Mm. I tried to get my guitar, but there seemed to be some sort of mm. volume, I don't know, frequency issue with the recording. So mm. I'm just going to leave it to Edith's beautiful voice to uh, to sing us a little something to I'm as flattered. we leave here. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, could we sing together at least? Okay. Oh, I'm... Um, I'm gonna. I'm a little bit nervous about the lack of. Okay, let me just nail it all the way. I just nice. sing the okay. the chorus. Feliz Navidad. Feliz Navidad. Feliz Navidad. Prospero año felicidad. Yeah. That's beautiful. <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna have. No, so yeah, I cannot wait to see this live one day. So I'm gonna open the floor to you two ladies to let people know where they can find you online if you want them to find you online or and any other information you'd like to share about yourself before we go. Oh, thank you, thank you, Frank, for this opportunity to speak in your podcast. We really appreciate. And I give shout outs to Lorraine. She's an amazing lady, the founder of Bitcoin Dada. She's doing a great job out there to empower women. Sending shout outs to her and keep on the good work, Lorraine. And for me, you can find me on Twitter. I'm active on Twitter and LinkedIn. Mary Usaji is my name, both on Twitter and LinkedIn. Thank you. Perfect.
Well, that's it. And for uh, just so that everybody knows, you can check the show notes and I'll have the, the handles and their names, everything spelled out, all that stuff, just in case you didn't. Um, yeah, in case you need that. So I will leave it there. Thank you again, Mary and Edith. This was more fun than I even thought it was going to be. You guys are both amazing. Thank you so much for doing this. And I'm sure we will Thank do you. it. Yeah, my pleasure. I'm sure we'll do it again sometime.